All right, it's good to see you all here this morning. We're going to start with 132 in your hymnals. 132, he lives. Let's stand and we'll sing. I serve a risen Savior. 132. I serve a risen Savior. He lives. 132. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The help of all who find none other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me. on check one two can you hear me maybe yes no maybe hear me yeah I'm, I'm I think a there oh, there we are all right Romans chapter 10 let's go to Romans chapter 10 this morning we're going to keep going through this I'm trying to uh, just do a, ba a basic New Testament survey here uh, but go to Romans chapter 10 and before we get started we're gonna we're gonna pray Lord, we thank you for getting us all here this morning, God. I pray you just bless this church and be in this church. And Lord, help us as, uh, as I teach this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help me to teach this, Lord, in a way that is, uh, is helpful for your people, Lord, that they'd be able to understand your words better as they read them, God, and that it would be a reflection, Lord, of what you gave to us. I pray you just help hide me behind the cross, help me to say everything I ought to say and nothing that I shouldn't, Lord, and to have the right heart behind it. I pray you just bless the hearers this morning, Lord, that they'd be able to grow spiritually from this, God. We love you. We thank for you. For being good to us and getting us here, Lord, thank you for dying for us. And God, we pray you come back soon and get us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So where we got to last week was uh, when Paul went through his whole ministry through the book of Acts. Uh, he's offering, he's still trying to get the Jews right. He's still trying to get them to accept this, uh, to get their hearts right, to get their hearts into the kingdom of God because he's not going to give them the kingdom of heaven unless they get the kingdom of God figured out first. They have got to get their hearts right, and they won't do it. And he's preaching at them, and everywhere Paul goes, first place he goes, he goes into a synagogue, sits down, preaches at the Jews in the synagogue, and things go from there. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes some of them get it, 
And he always ends up with Gentiles, and the Gentiles seem to always take it a lot better than the Jews do. And when he gets to the end of the book of Acts, he does the final rejection of the Jewish people, where he says, look, I'm done, I'm going to the Gentiles. So Paul at that point is in prison in Rome. Uh, the Jews have rejected. It says some of them heard and some of them didn't. And he goes on preaching the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Uh, one of the things that people try to do, and a lot of what your organized religion tries to do, is they try and set up a kingdom on this earth. Catholic Church has been trying to set up a kingdom on this earth for the last 2,000, well, not 2,000 years, 1,800 years. 1,600 years since they were founded. And what do they do? They go out with fire and sword trying to force people to keep their Catholic law. If you don't go to Catholic Mass on Sunday morning, it's a crime. That's what they're trying to push on the people that are under them. That's what it was in the Middle Ages. Uh, you, could be, you could get arrested for not going to Mass if you're not going because you believe it's heresy or whatever. Um, people got burned at the stake for saying that the Mass is a uh, sacrifice to devils. You say, no, I'm not going there. Uh, they had one lady, they were going to burn her at the stake, and they said, you either recant or, or you're going to go to hell and burn with the devil. And she says, if I wanted to see the devil, I'd go to mass. She's got some backbone to her. <laughs> uh, Romans chapter 10, though, Paul is preaching. What happens is around 60, that's in the end of the book of Acts, the opportunity is lost. It is gone. The Jews are rejected in terms of being able to get this kingdom for the duration of the church age. They have lost their opportunity. So Romans chapter 10, Paul is preaching about this. Look down in verse uh, 17. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? But first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Esaias is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. That's us. The Gentiles didn't go out looking for a Messiah. Jesus Christ came to the Jews, the Jews rejected him, and the Gentiles found him as a result. We didn't go out looking for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ found us. He says, verse 20, But he sighs his variable and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me. But to Israel he saith, All the day long I have stretched forth mine hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. He's been after them and after them and after them, and they're not listening. But in verse 19, he talks about that jealousy. Uh, hold your hand in Romans 10, because we're going to be jumping back here a bunch. Uh, but go to, hold your hand there and go to Deuteronomy 32. This is what he's clo uh, quoting. He's quoting um, Moses when they're out in the wilderness and uh, God's giving them promises and he's telling them, look, you're going to go into this land, you follow the rules, everything's going to be great, I'm going to bless you, you're going to be rich, everything's going to be fantastic, I'm going to beat down all your enemies before your face and life's just going to be great. And if you don't live right, horrible, horrible, horrible things are going to happen to you. He spends like the first, I think, about, I think if I'm thinking 32. Uh, there's Deuteronomy 32, and then there's also Deuteronomy 28. We're not going to go there, but Deuteronomy 28 is him saying, if you do right, I'll bless you. That's the first 14 verses. And then he says, if you don't do right, I'm going to curse you. And that's verse 15 through 68. It's a lot worse. The, the downside's a lot worse than the upside. But in Deuteronomy 32, look down in verse 21. Um, verse, jump back to 20, uh, or 19 for context. It says, When the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. And that's what Jesus Christ, when he's talking, when he's in here preaching, and he's got the centurion, he says, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Verse 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. A lot of times what you see in the Old Testament, when God is talking about his people committing idolatry, he compares it to adultery. And when a wife steps out on her husband, 
he becomes jealous of her. He wants her. He wants her solely to himself. And when the Jews worship another god, he says, it's like you're stepping out on me. That's what it feels like. That's the whole book of Hosea, is Hosea marries a woman who's unfaithful to him. And God says, this is now you know what it feels like. And he says, when you went out to your other gods and you went about your other ways to try and to, to try and earn, you're going after Moloch, you're going after Ashtaroth, you're going after Baal and all them, I get jealous of you. So because I'm jealous of you, I'm going to make you jealous of me. He says, finish the verse. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. He says, if you're not going to stay faithful to me, I'm going to offer salvation to these Gentiles. And that's going to infuriate you. Because when, you, when a Jew sees God blessing a Gentile, it's like, well, hold on, I'm God's chosen people. Now, when it comes to physical things, you can't judge that by what, you can't judge how much a God loves a person by how well they're doing in life. I mean, look at what the rich, look at the rich people. Like, is, is Jeff Bezos a great Christian? Is Mark Zuckerberg a great Christian? Is Bill Gates a great Christian? Is No. Most of the time, these are horrible, well, I won't say they're horrible people. They're just people that have been given a lot of money. Because God only knows what we'd be if God gave us $3 billion. Say, well, they're horrible people. I can't believe they did this. Well, if I drop $3 billion in your lap, you know, you might be on your third or fourth marriage by now, too. Uh, <laughs> but go back to Romans, Romans chapter 10. And that's what he's talking about. He says, when it comes to salvation, he says, you know what? I'm going to try and provoke them to jealousy. I'm going to try and win their heart back by going to these Gentiles and offering them salvation and saying, you know what, I'm going to deal, ex not exclusively, but mostly with Gentiles for the next age, which is the church age. Um, Paul writes, he writes um, uh, Romans through uh, Philemon. He may write Hebrews. That's up for debate. Uh, but he's writing through his life. He dies around 63 A.D., gets I believe he gets beheaded. It's not exactly known. It's not in the Bible how Paul dies, but uh, tradition has him being beheaded in Rome. Uh, John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle, two different people. John the Apostle lives until about 90 AD. He is the last living apostle, and he gets exiled to the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. He gets exiled to Patmos as a salt mine, and he's about a 90-year-old man at this point. And they exile him there to do manual labor to die. And while he's there, God, or he writes the book of John. Now, the important thing about when he writes the book of John is that he is writing the book of John after Paul has written all of his epistles. Uh, when you read through Acts, there are different uh, meetings of the church and the church heads where they're trying to figure out doctrine where Peter's saying stuff and James is saying stuff and John, and they're trying to work out what exactly happened on Calvary. What exactly is God doing to Jews? Because they'll go out and they'll, do, they'll, they'll have a revival, and then Gentiles will get the Holy Ghost on them, and they're confused. How come a Gentile has the Holy Ghost on them? That's never happened before. So a lot of the book of Acts is them working through, trying to understand how is God working now. And John writes his gospel after all that's been figured out, so when he writes it, the way he writes it is with a Pauline slant on it. Uh, what is the most popular verse in the whole Bible? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John's, or Jesus says that in John 3. Jesus hasn't died yet. John emphasizes the parts of Jesus' life where he preaches about the gospel that's going to come into place after he dies. So that's why you can lead somebody to Jesus Christ from the book of John. It's a lot harder to do out of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written in, the, in terms of the timeline a lot earlier on. Then when the guys said, when Matthew and Mark and Luke sat down to write it, they wrote their books a lot earlier on and they tend to focus more towards the Jewish perspective. Matthew's all about, guys, Jewish people, you need to get your hearts right or Jesus is going to reject you. John takes it from the perspective of, this is what salvation is. And that's why when you, if you ever are witnessing to a person and they don't get saved, 
you can say, well, can you promise me you'll read the book of John? That's why they have John and Romans, those little John and Romans things that you can hand out. It's John because John has the plan of salvation very, very clear in it. And Romans also has it very clear. Romans is a little bit more technical, but if you have somebody who's not saved, you don't just say, you know, well, you need to read your Bible. Start in Genesis. <laughs> it ain't going to work. <laughs> if by some miracle they make it to, like, Leviticus, it's going to take another miracle to get them through it. To actually get to where they could get the information that's clear enough to where they could get saved from it, you have to get up to about John. And then, we're, you know, the, the most common way to win somebody to Jesus Christ is the Romans road. So that's your, first Paul, that's your first Pauline epistle. That's the first book that Paul wrote. Now, Romans chapter 11, so I, I, say, I say all that. John also wrote um, Revelations around 90 AD. He's on the aisle. That's in Revelation chapter 1. He's on the aisle, and he gets, God calls him up to heaven, and he sees all this. So John writes the last book of the Bible around 90 AD, and that's what you call the close of the canon. Canon is anything that is accepted to be doctrinally accurate. Um, you will see, you'll hear that phrase thrown around sometimes with very complicated TV shows or books. This, I, I'm going to shoot myself for saying this. But whenever somebody writes a new Star Wars book, they have to fight over whether or not it's canon. Has, have, has anybody heard anything about this, or am I just, I don't read anything Star Wars for the record. Okay, Jesse gets it. But, but whenever they have, you have something like that that's a very popular thing, like Marvel or Lord of the Rings, they say, well, is it canon? Well, that's just saying, is this something that's approved to be true, or is this just some fan writing something? Uh, John, the book of John, is the last canonically accepted book of the Bible. You say, well, what about uh, the, the, uh, the book of Bartholomew, or the book of, uh, what's his, something the shepherd, what is it? Shepherd of Hermas, that's what, yeah. What about the shepherd of Hermas? What about the book of Judas? It's not canonically accepted. That means that for whatever reason, when the church fathers were putting the Bible together, they said, that's not reliable. We don't know where it came from. We don't know who actually wrote it. It doesn't align with the rest of the scriptures. It's not inspired. It didn't come from God. There might be some good lessons you could learn from it. When the King James translators translated the King James, they put the Apocrypha in there. But they said, little asterisk, <laughs> this is not inspired scripture. This is good learning, but not necessary, and it may not be true. So they said it's, it's, it's a Bible-themed story. If you ever read, um, you know, I won't go into that one because that one's even more. Sorry. Romans chapter 11 then. So you look at this, you say, okay, God, is, God has taken his hand off of the Jewish nation as a whole at this point. He's no longer dealing with them. He's dealing with whosoever will, let him come. Gentile nations. You don't have to go to Israel. There is no kingdom of heaven present. There's no physical place you have to go to and become a citizen of that country to get saved. You're, the, you're a foolish nation. Anybody who's saved is a member of this foolish nation. Now, Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people... God forbid, for I, am, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's saying, is God done with Israel? No. He says, Jews can still get saved. He says, I'm a Jew, I'm saved, and I'm the chief apostle, basically, at this point. He says, so I'm not throwing the Jewish nation away. And if you look at the context and what we've been reading up to this point, where he talked about, I'm trying to make the Jews jealous, he's trying to make them jealous because he's trying to get them back. He's not throwing them away and then just trying to make them jealous to make them miserable. He's trying to fix that relationship that he had with the Jewish people. And you get that by reading the rest of Romans chapter 11. Now, this is very important for you as a Christian because if you don't get this relationship figured out and you think that God has thrown away the Jews, the phrase that you'll hear a lot is finally and forever. You say, if you hear somebody say, God, God left the Jews finally and forever at Calvary, at Pentecost, at this, at that, at that, at that. Uh, that's a person who's anti-Semitic. It's a person who's against the Jewish people. And your Bible is very, very plainly Zionistic and pro-Israel. It is dogmatically Zionistic and pro-Israel. Now, jump down to verse 11. 
Uh, there's a lot here, and I can't teach the whole Romans chapter 11. I'm going to give you the, the highlights of it. Uh, but down in verse 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled, the Jews, that they should fall? God forbid. He calls the church age them stumbling, not them falling. But rather, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy, to fix that relationship, to make them jealous of, hey, I've given spiritual peace to the Gentiles. Uh, when you get saved, you build that relationship. You, you have a relationship with God that you build on through the rest of your Christian walk. You're growing. And you have a relationship like the Old Testament saints had. Similar, not the same, but similar in the sense that you walk with God, you begin to understand God, you please God, you become a friend to God. And, um, where did I go with this? You build off of that, and that's when you get saved and you're put in this kingdom of God, you have that relationship with him. And the Jews don't have that. Uh, the Catholics don't have that. Uh, Mother Teresa died saying she felt like she did not know who God was. And she is the poster child for being a good Catholic. Um, there's a book out there called the, uh, the Last Sayings of Saints and Sinners. And it's the last words of all of these famous people who have died. Some of them are martyrs. Some of them are uh, presidents. Some of them are all these different people that talk about what did they feel at the end of their life? What were their last words before they died? And if you don't have a walk with Jesus Christ, when you get to the end of it, it's kind of hollow. There's the, and uh, the, the lost, not the lost, the, 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 the apostate Christian church will talk about, oh, you need to have Jesus Christ in your life to fill that void, and you just, there's a void that needs to be filled. That's true. That's not really the primary reason that most people get saved. So I just, I just have this void that I need to be filled. Yes, that's true, you do. Um, you do want to get saved because, you know, you don't want to go to hell. That's a big one. Wanting to have your sins forgiven, having the weight and guilt of sin on you, that's another reason a lot of people get saved. A lot of it isn't, and you will, as a lost person, search for something. There's something out there. I need to know what it is. And God gave you a purpose, and that's to, that is to, to please him, and that's the only way to fill that void that people talk about. Um, chapter 11 Look down in verse 17. He begins to liken being in this kingdom of God to a tree. Down in verse 17, 11, 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So grafting there, what it's talking about is you can take a tree, and you can break a branch off of that tree and drill into that tree and put a hole in that tree and take a branch from another tree, sharpen it down, and put it in that hole, and that branch will take to that tree. It will graft into that tree. So what he's talking about, he says, if you're a wild olive tree, and feel, feel out how the whole chapter talks about Gentiles. He says, you're the wild mm -hmm. olive tree. The Jews, the olive tree. He says, I'm trying to make the Jewish nation jealous with a foolish nation. You and I are always the back seat. We are always second fiddle. We are always there. Yes, I've, I'm going after you to make them jealous. The focus is always the Jewish nation. It's always the Jewish people. It's always the goal is to get back to God to fix that relationship with the Jewish nation. Now, verse 18, boast not thyself against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You're not supposed to be putting down on the Jews because, well, we got in and you got out. And that's not a good attitude to have anyways about anything. Verse 19, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee, lest he also spare not thee. He says, when the Jews messed up, when they rejected their Messiah on Calvary and over the next 60 years or so, and they just said, we don't want him, we don't believe in him, we're not going to take him, 
He says, I broke them off of that tree. I pulled them out of having an opportunity to get this kingdom of heaven. I stopped dealing with them as a nation. He says, now if I would do that to my people, I will definitely do it to you. And what he's talking about is in terms of nationally. He says, nationally, I removed the nation of Israel from this kingdom of God. They're not connected anymore. He says, and I have let whoever, whatever member of whatever wild olive tree wants to get in, I'll let you in. He says, but nationally, and that's why this is, this is what's key in this chapter, is that he's talking nationally. This is not a reference to your personal salvation. Because what he's talking about here is, is that if you, you better watch your own self, because if you don't watch your own self, I'll break this branch off and put the other one back in. Well, you can't lose your salvation. You know that from uh, Philippians chapter 1 and all the cross references to go into that. You know, uh, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You have eternal security. What's he talking about? Jump down to verse 25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. He says, the Gentiles, y'all have some time in this tree to bear some fruit. I grafted your branches in so you could bear some fruit, and you could do that for a little while. And then when your time is done, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, those branches are getting broken off, and I'm putting the original ones back in the tree. And that's where you get into the rest of this, and so all Israel shall be saved, down in verse 28. Um, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. In terms of giving out the gospel and seeing people saved, anybody who's not a Christian, and even some Christians for that matter, are an enemy. Somebody's preaching, well, repent and be baptized, and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is not a part of your salvation. That person's an enemy. They're preaching a heresy. Because if somebody gets baptized believing that their baptism saves them, they're not going to get saved. If they're saying, well, I've got to believe and then get baptized, when they ask, God, please save me, and then I'll get baptized and I can be saved, they're not getting saved. If somebody's out there preaching Mormonism or, Je or, or their Jehovah's Witness or their Islam or the Buddhism, they are an enemy spiritually Keep in mind, church age, kingdom of God, this doesn't exist right now on earth. This is gone. So when I say they're an enemy, that does not mean that you invade them and pillage their villages and steal their women and their cows. All right? That means that, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Put on the whole armor of God, and we've been through this. What is the armor? It's faith, truth, righteousness, the word of God, salvation. They're all concepts. They are, they're not physical things. You can't lay your hand on truth. You say, well, I can hold a Bible. The Bible has truth in it, but the only truth in it is when you read it, understand it, and say, this is what God said. It's, it, it is a kind of a strange thing to try and explain, but you can't hold salvation in your hand. You can't hold righteousness in your hand. It's not a thing. It's a spiritual thing. So when we get into their enemies, spiritually a Jews an enemy. They're saying you have to go to you have to go to the synagogue, you have to keep the Sabbath, you can't eat pork to stand, you have to do all these things, and you uh, earn favor with God through all those things. That makes them an enemy in that regard. You've got to spiritually do battle with them to try and win them to Jesus Christ. And now you also have to be careful with how far you take that. Keep your hand in Romans chapter eleven. And jump back, or in Romans 11, really quickly before we jump, Romans 11, 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. When God gives something, he does not take it away. Now keep your hand there and go to Genesis chapter 12. There are promises in the Bible that God says that if you do this, then I will do this. If you do not, then I will do this other thing. That's what we're talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Follow my laws. I'll bless you with a lot of stuff, and things will be great. If you don't follow my laws, I'm going to curse you. 
That is a conditional promise. That does not mean that the Jews, no matter what happens, are going to make money and be rich and be strong and powerful. It says, no, if you follow my laws, it's a conditional promise. It's like working for somebody. If you work for me, I will pay you $12 an hour. If you do not work, I will fire you. This is not one of those promises. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into the land that I will show thee. This is the first time Abram shows up. Verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. Promise. No condition. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Promise. No condition. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed. That is a prom if you read before that and after that, that is an isolated statement. God says, I am going to bless you. If I say, I'm going to give you $50, it doesn't matter what you do. If I was God and I was always going to keep my word, it doesn't matter what you do to me, what you do to my family, what you do to my friends, what you do to my church, I'm going to give you $50 if I'm honest, if, I, if I'm going to keep my word. It is an unconditional promise that God gives here that he will curse anyone that curses the Jews. So you've got to watch when you get into some of these, some of these Christians, people who get a little far out there, and they start saying, well, do you know that the Jews run the media? Do you know that all these major people in Hollywood, they're all Jews? Do you know that they, they're all, all the producers in Hollywood, they're all Jews? Do you know that the whole, uh, everybody, every major news network is owned by a Jew? And all this liberal slant, it's all done by Jews. So the Jews are the one. The really, the real, the, the fault of America, you know, and all, the reason everybody's going downhill is because of all the bad stuff the news media puts out. It's run by the Jews. The Jews are the problem with America. And you know that all the banks are run by the, the Jews. The Jews own all the, all the banks. All the major banks are all run by different Jewish people, by Goldstein and Sachs and all these uh, Rockefeller, uh, not Rockefeller, um, oh, and the Bilderbergers. All the, they're all Jews. They're all Jewish people. The Jewish people are the problem with the financial system. And then what they do is they take all that and they get all spun up and they say, you know what? The real problem with this world is the Jews. And that's anti-Semitism. Now, the Bible says that they are enemies concerning the gospel. Do the Jews run all that stuff? Yeah, probably. Pretty sure they do. Uh, I didn't realize this until I got to college, but the Jewish people are incredibly liberal. They are incredibly liberal. You would think they'd be conservative because of all that Old Testament law. About, you know, like man not lying with mankind and all that stuff, and you know, all the the, the things they're supposed to keep, they're trying to keep their all their stuff. No, they're super progressive. Tel Aviv is one of the gayest cities in the world. That's why that's why their own admission. They call itself one of the gayest cities in the whole world, Tel Aviv. And that's in that's in Israel. Concerning the gospel, spiritually speaking, they're not saved. And they have a blindness on their heart. That doesn't mean they can't get saved, because Paul says, verse 1, I got saved, I'm in this, and saved Jewish people tend to be very good Christians. I was talking to um, Jean yesterday, and he sent me a, 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 a preacher, his name was some, uh, Hyman Applebaum, and he was from Russia, he was a Jewish guy, and he started the camp meeting movement in America. He's a Southern Baptist, he probably wasn't perfect, okay, yeah. But he started the camp meeting movement. He started all these revivals. I believe that Billy Sunday built off the back of Hyman Applebaum. From what I can make sure, I don't have done. I did a little bit of reading on him, but he's a good. He was a good, godly, god fearing man. They said that into his 80s, he had zeal and passion for souls. He's a Jewish guy. Uh, pastor talks about Les Coppinger. He was a saved Jew. What was he doing? Invested in students, trying to take care of students. Paul is the most zealous person in your Bible. He has, he has so much zeal for lost souls that he says, I would wish myself a curse for my brethren. Now, I want to see people get saved. I'll do what I can to go on a visitation, try and pray and ask God for open doors. Hell, God, uh, God, I want to be a better witness. God, I need to hand out tracts. But would I send myself to hell for another person? I am not that selfless. Paul said he'd do it. I'm not on that ground. I am not on that ground, but Paul was. Uh, but Paul's whole thing here is he's saying, we are the temporary. We are the, we are the church. We are the gaps. We are the mystery that got put in here of, to make the Jewish nation jealous. Now, 
the question <laughs> of the church for the last, it's been big for about 40 years now, is how long is the church age? Now, everybody knows, and I'm, I'm going to run some basic references on this. Go to Hosea chapter 6. This church age that's talked about is referenced lightly in the Old Testament. It's referenced a couple times through the New Testament as to how long is this church age. And anybody that you talk to is going to tell you it's 2,000 years. Talk to me, I'm going to tell you it's 2,000 years. Uh, Hosea chapter 6. Hosea, and this is, I referenced Hosea at the beginning. What does Hosea do? God tells Hosea to marry a harlot, and he says... Now you know how I feel when the Jews go and they spiritually worship other gods. And uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. After two days. Uh, the reference for one day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And when you read through your New Testament, and it says Jesus did this for two days, and after six days he does this, and in eight days he does this, you need to watch those references, because almost every time it talks about how many days Jesus does something or how long he is somewhere, it's a reference to church age, second advent, Millennial kingdom or uh, rapture. Uh, go to John chapter 11. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this because there's a lot of guys out there that have a lot of good content, uh, but they end up, they end up anti-Semitic, and you've got to learn how to weed. You've got to learn how to chew the meat and spit out the bones, and if you can't do that, you just need to avoid it until you can. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 1, now a certain man was sick, he, what's his name, Lazarus of Bethany, Bethany, he's a Jew of the town of Mary and her sister Martha, uh, jump down to, I'll read the whole thing, verse 2, and it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped her feet with her, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick, therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick, and Jesus heard that he, or I'm sorry, when Jesus heard that he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. This is done to get Jesus Christ glory. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. And after that, he saith to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. For two days, Jesus Christ sits and waits. And in that time, Lazarus dies. If you apply that spiritually, the Jewish nation is sick. The Jewish nation dies. Jesus Christ waits two days. He waits 2,000 years. And what happens? He goes into Bethany. He comes to Bethany, which is right next to Jerusalem, and he raises a Jew from the dead. And that's a type of your tribulation rapture at the end of the tribulation where he resurrects all the Jews that have been killed in the tribulation. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 17. Come back to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1. Oh, if you start 1628, he, Jesus is preaching, and it says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes in his kingdom, second advent. It's, and we'll get into all that and the chronology and all that um, in a, a little bit later on. Verse, or chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days... Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brother. What's after six days? Seventh day. If you read uh, the companion passage to this, is Luke 9.28. It says, and about eight days later. So what's after six and about eight? Seven. Now, running, 
uh, running the time all the way back, you go through your, your chronology and you go through history to try and date when did different events happen. Uh, you run back about 600 BC is the, the invasion of Babylon into uh, Judea. Then you start running chronology. So and so was so many years old and they had so and so. Somebody was so and so years old and they had so many, and so on and so forth. You run all those dates back. And you get Adam being born somewhere around 4,000 BC. Um, for different doctrinal reasons, you can say Adam fell after 33 years or 30 years. I won't get into all that, but the important thing is 4,000 years. If you run 4,000 years back, Jesus Christ is born after 4,000 years, and then you have a 2,000 year church age, and then you go to the millennium which is 1,000 years, you get 4 plus 2 plus 1, which is 7. That gives God a 7,000-year earth. If the one year with the Lord is as, or one day with the Lord is as 1,000 years. So a week typed out in your Bible is a picture of this whole timeline. And God puts these things in there to teach you about what's coming. Now, what does happen here in Matthew 17? And after six days, on the seventh day, four, two, after six days, six days is right here at the end of the church age, after six days, what happens? Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun, S-U-N, Malachi 4. He's called the son of righteousness when he comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And it says, and he tramples his enemies under feet, and they turn to ash. And it's, keep reading, and his raiment was white as the light, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. And this Moses and Elias pop up again. Malachi 4, book of Revelation. After six days... Jesus Christ, it says he was transfigured, his face is as the sun, it's exact, he's showing them, he's giving them a picture of what's going to happen right here in the year 6000 AD, not 8 AD, Ooh, Lord help us, not 6000 AD, in the year 6000 after Adam. So if you have a 2000 year church age, and you want to start the church, it says in Acts 2 that there are as many as were added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you had 2,000 years to 33, you'd say, well, the church age is over in 2033. I would like to say that. And I'm not going to for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that the calendar may not be perfect. Uh, if, if you think about it, Jesus Christ, when he was born, they weren't like, okay, it's 0 AD. There's got to be a king around here somewhere. Like, we don't switch to AD. Well, who, it's, it's AD. It's Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Well, here's the Lord. We haven't figured that out yet. But he must have been born this year. No, they're going off a Jewish calendar. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, Middle East right now, it's like somewhere around 13 or 1400 because they base their calendar off Muhammad when Islam starts. You go to the Jews right now, I think it's year like 4700 if you go to Jewish calendar. Um, we got what's called, I believe it's, is it Julian or Gregorian? We're on the Julian now. We're on the Julian calendar now. When we switched from Pope Gregory's calendar to Pope Julian's calendar, um, they were kind of guessing the year that Jesus was born based on trying to figure out how long things were and when dates happened, and they're going off manuscripts, and it wasn't the most accurate thing. And sometimes God does stuff in the Bible by numbers, I'll say this, he does things by numbers a lot, and his numbers tend to add up perfectly. Sometimes, I'll say this, God wants you to know, and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> Are we close? Oh my goodness, yes, we're close. Am I going to sell everything I have the day before Passover in 2033? No. There's an obsession in the Christian church right now with looking for signs, and blood moons, and trumpets, and wars, and rumors of wars, and trying to figure out what a horseman is, and what apocalypse, and what's going on. And you are not, as a Christian, supposed to be looking for all that mess. 
I will tell you honestly, if you want to know when the end of times is coming, look at the people. Don't look at, oh, well, is there, there's a blood moon that's happening while Venus is in retrograde. Okay, so what? Look at the people. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 that talks about in the end times, people will do these things. And then look at the people around you. Because the problem is people try to sit there, I'm going to sit up cloistered in my little study and try and figure out when the end time is happening. Go out and witness to people and figure out when the end time is happening. Look at the rest of the world. What is the whole world doing? Not just America, not just your community, not just these people. What is the whole world doing? And the world can do a lot now that it couldn't do 100,000 years ago. So I say all this to say, keep your heart right with God, and such a day as you think not, so is the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And people say, well, the rapture could be at this time. That's true. You could also walk out of here and get hit by an 18-wheeler, and for all intents and purposes, you're done down here. You say, well, what if the rapture's this, and the rapture's that, and the rapture's this? What if, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth? So, should you live thinking the rapture's today? Yes. Live like you're going to see Jesus on Tuesday. Live having everything done that you need to be done. Live staying right with God to where if he calls you up <laughs> or strikes you down, you're ready to see him tomorrow. As a Christian, that's how you're supposed to live. The rapture, I would love for the rapture to happen today. Love, it would be great. I'm not going to fight it at all. But does it, in terms of how you live your life, knowing the date of the rapture shouldn't affect you at all. You would, if I could say here dogmatically it's going to happen in two days or in 12 years or in 20 years or in 200 years, it shouldn't change a thing about how you're living in terms of your walk with God. Uh, next week, I went through all of that to talk about the, God's letting go of the Jews temporarily to work with the church now. We'll get into what's written to you as a Christian and why and how you can know what to apply to yourself. Um, because that's, that's why we, I, this is all background information for next week. So let's pray. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for being good to us. I pray, the Lord, that something that was stood up here would help the, the people in this church, Lord, to, to live closer to you, Lord, to live closer to your words, to live in them, God, to, to let them affect them, to let them change them, God, to, to study them harder, Lord, and to, to know you and to know your heart, God. I pray you'd help us as Christians, God, be more pleasing to you on a, every day that we live, Lord. We love you, God. We pray you would come back soon and take us home, Lord. I know that's much better than any of us going by the grave, Lord. I know none of us want that. I pray you would come back soon and get us, Father. That's not our wills, but yours be done. And we pray that you would just bless the uh, service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.